Okay, good morning everybody again. Um, I was quite impressed last afternoon by, by all the effort you guys put into the work set. Um, it is quite steep going if you never have done uh, some numerical coding before, but I was impressed how far even those got who hadn't done anything before. And those with experience, I think, made it quite far. Out of curiosity, um, who managed to get to the discontinuous Galerkin? That was a little bit much. But you've got a few more days left here, so <laughs> spend your evenings wisely. Uh, who, who got to the pseudo-spectral stuff? No? Quite a few. And who got some of the forward Euler working? An advecting wave. Not bad at all. Um, walking around yesterday afternoon, I saw a, a few very frequently recurring uh, initial mistakes people make when, when doing coding and also when starting out with Python. So I, start, I thought I'll start today with about 10 minutes of, the, of pointing out some things to avoid and what to do instead. Um, one thing I believe pretty much anybody does who's using Jupyter regularly, regular, uh, frequently, is everybody will have their own block of top line matter that's being cut and pasted from Jupyter Notebook to Jupyter Notebook. Uh, this is my current version, basically loading a few um, um, modules that are almost always needed. And then following this with this, this matplotlet inline line here uh, makes plot appear immediately once you type plt.plot and you don't have to do an extra show afterwards. Um, if you're running on a uh, Apple computer with LSD display, this is useful. It makes uh, higher resolution figures. And I also end up by now always printing the version of Python I am using because I'm actually switching around between a lot of different computers, a lot of different supercomputers as well. And especially between Python 2 and Python 3, there are a few syntax inconsistencies. And so I, I got into the habit of just always printing the Python version. And especially I had once a case where it actually said I'm using a Python 3 notebook and it was still printing Python 2.7. So things can happen. Okay. okay, one thing many, many people seem to do is this type of stuff here. Um, I guess I need to make this even bigger. That you somehow create an array, and then you need to get data into the array. And the first impulse usually is, let's write a loop over the grid points, and then let's do something for each grid point separately. Um, that's necessary in some older programming languages. But luckily in Python, this is almost never necessary. And you should avoid spelling out loops whenever you can. The main reasons are loops are more error prone to write than without the, the indexing. You can get the index as well. Or more important, you can get the range wrong, which I saw quite a lot of times yesterday. Um, the output code is more lengthy and that's that more difficult to read later on. If you come back to your, to your script half a year later and you won't try to understand it again. If you hand this off to somebody else and somebody else tries to understand. And it's also significantly slower to execute than if you can if you get around writing this without loops. And significant means factors of 10 quite easily. For the examples we did yesterday, it didn't really matter much because those run in only a few seconds. But even towards the end of the worksheet when the high-resolution runs take for a minute or more, waiting a minute or waiting 10 minutes is a significant difference. The way to do this, especially this, this particular example, is by either 
find the right Python function to do exactly what you want to do. For instance, if you want equally spaced uh, values in an array, Python has a function called linspace. Uh, finding all these functions requires a lot of cooking around early time, and especially looking at other people's code, looking at other people that have more experience with Python over the shoulder, and just pay attention to how they might be solving certain problems. The other important thing is to use is if you're using NumPy arrays, which the NumPy zeros and the NumPy lens space already gives you, then they have built-in automatic vectorized operations. So the X here is a array of length of this particular case 50. And if you're taking NumPy operations on such an array, it will automatically return an array of the same size with the operation applied individually to each element. So this one line here is equivalent to these two lines up there, except that you don't have the loop that you might get wrong, and except that you don't have the indexing that you might get wrong, and that's also vastly faster. OK, so faster mode, you might say. This works great for, for setting up the initial data, where each x value you want to evaluate the e to the minus 2 pi cosine x, e to the minus 2 cosine 2 pi x. But what do you do for the, for the derivative? Um, so it turns out there's another really nice feature in Python, and indexing an array is a lot more um, flexible than just plugging in a certain number. So here's a few examples. Let me execute the cell just to see what you get. Uh, this time around, we just make a little space with 11 elements. I have not put in the endpoint equals false, so I'm actually getting a bit point right at the end of the 1.0. And if you put in the X, you get all the 11 numbers, no big surprise. But you can now go off and, and index this thing in a lot of interesting ways. All of you know that it X of just one integer gives you one number back. But you can, for instance, say, I want all the elements starting at the second one up to a target endpoint. If you don't put in the target endpoint, it goes to the end of the array. And so this now starts at point two, from cutting away the first two, it goes up to one. We can play the same thing the opposite way around and uh, eliminate points from the end with a negative index. That gives, again, all points except the last two, because I put the minus two here. And you even can get to the last element by directly with indexing the negative number, so this x of minus two. And these types of slicing operations are very useful when computing the, the finite difference uh, code. So I think all of you spent quite some time yesterday writing the, a function uh, equivalent to this one here. And that was my, <coughs> my version of this function. So I'm taking in the data u. I have a comment here, a help text, explaining what this function actually does. This is also very good practice to get into, writing help text of what your function do. The, Primary reason for writing help texts is not to document your code. This is, this is rather unimportant, actually. Not completely, but, but still. The absolute primary reason for writing, for documenting your code, is that while you're writing the help text, you actually are forced to think what the function is supposed to be doing. So it clarifies your own mind what you are doing. And of course, the usual uh, advantage of documentation, it tells you and others what your code is doing, so if yourself come back a year later, you can still remember what this code is actually doing. Okay, so we take it back to you, we copy it, and now we begin to fill in with the final differencing. This, the zero bit point is, we need to hard code by hand, it's the first bit point, one to the right, minus one to the left, wrap around, 
because of the periodic boundary conditions. And I'm avoiding putting it in minus one here because I can use the minus one, which avoids me having to figure out how long the year is. The second line here is what essentially what most of you had been writing with, with a loop going from one to n minus two. And you can do this with slicing. So I, I want to fill from the second to the second to last grid point of, of that U array. And then, or from the, from the second to the second to last. And I'm filling it with the, the array from the third to the end, minus the array from the first to the third from the end. So these are both, all of these are slices with two less grid points than the total array, and they are shifted left and right to exactly give us the, the finite difference stencil that we're looking for. And then the final grid point, well, again, we have to code by hand, I'm mixing the array directly. Uh, negative numbers are again your friend, because they avoid you having to figure out whether we put n, n minus 1, n minus 2. Sounds good. Any questions? The other interesting thing that is best avoided, this isn't immediately clear in, in short pieces of code, but it becomes quite obvious when you write longer pieces of code, is this type of setup here. But one is first defining some global variable, say the number of grid points you're starting out with, 50. And then you're defining your version of du dx, uh, which has three problems. Two of the problems are going back to what I said, said above. This version uses again an explicit loop. And so this is slower than it can be. And also, this time around, I realized that, oh, this, this indexing of negative indices actually works quite well. We can actually do this to do the wraparound. And so I, I, I realized that you can actually write this range loop ridiculously, strangely, starting two elements to the left of the beginning of the start of it in the array and suitably ending at the end. I wonder whether this should be n minus two. And it actually turns out that the suitable negative numbers you can be that floating around here actually make all, all of this work out correctly with hyperbound. So this, this is actually quite code model perhaps the n minus two. But this is so smart that afterwards nobody will recognize what this actually does and why it is working. Um, definitely if you show this to somebody else, they will not understand what this code does. And even if you show it to yourself in a few weeks time, or like me right now, showing it to myself after writing it last night, even now I can't figure out whether this should be an n minus one or n minus two. So this type of, of overly smart code is, is best to be avoided. But the reason I'm showing this example again is not, is not to, to tell you to avoid overly smart code, but is to warn you that this n equals 50 up there, and then using it inside the function is dangerous. This is called use of global variables inside a function. And so you're, you're breaking the locality of the function. What the function does now suddenly depends on something outside the function, which one very easily loses control of. So these are a few things, few ideas, how this particular implementation can go wrong. So here I have my error scenario number one. I am making an array, I'm filling it with data, I'm calling the function that's supposed to compute my, my derivative, and what's going to happen and why. 
of the number of elements of the array, not the the end that you define. Exactly. Um, because now if you have run across your instructor again, the instructor told you, oh, 50 grid points are just too many, use 30. If you now switch over to using 30, but you forgot the end further up. And if you run this, you get an error message uh, that you are indexing that you're indexing index 30 is out of bounds. This is still good because at least you get an error message. You know that something is wrong. It can get a lot worse. So here's scenario number two. We are making an array of length 50. We call it the index. It works perfectly, like a charm. We change some variable, which nobody remembers anymore that this has anything to do with the function. Then we call execute the identical statement we executed above, and now suddenly it fails. Again, unintended consequences because this function dudx um, relies on global information that it shouldn't be. So far, still, we get at least error messages. But you can play this game even more interestingly, like here, where we are not getting an error message, but we are starting off with a sine wave at 120 points, and we get back only about 60 points. So this, this is actually the most dangerous case that your function returns something, and you're not aware that what it returns might be wrong. Bottom line, always keep functions local that what, what they uh, return does only correspond to the parameters you pass in. There is no other dependence on some global information elsewhere. In my case up there, for instance, I was setting the grid spacing by uh, one over the number of elements. This is now better because I don't have any hard coded end floating around anymore. But this is still dangerous because this still makes the assumption that my, my grid goes from exactly from zero to exactly one. If now sometimes later I come about and want to change x min x max of the grid, then again, this function would have to be updated. OK, so much for Python 101, or minus 99. Just a few points to keep in mind. Any questions about this? Then let's actually move on and begin talking about numerical relativity again. And fill in a lot of the introductory material that I skipped yesterday and, and all the formalisms that, that's behind numerical relativity. So the, the one thing I, I even skipped yesterday because I wanted to get to the numerics as quickly as I could. What happened to the pins? Cool, thank you. Ah, because toy word, toy word, whiteboard, whiteboard. I'd rather check than, than discovering that I have a permanent marker in between. <laughs> Is the um, the major applications of NR?
the, the most important one is uh, the merger of two compact objects, compact binary coalescence. As this is called in, in LIGO speak, where you have your two bodies orbiting about each other, they are getting closer and closer, orbiting faster and faster. Eventually they merge and then they ring down quite a simple level. And out of this, among the important LIGO things in life, comes the waveform. First, has long frequencies then higher frequencies, and then the ring down at the end. And the early part here is, is post-Newtonian, when the two bodies are still far enough apart. But when you get closer to merger, everything becomes more linear. Uh, this is the numerical relativity uh, machine. And that's important because the, the black holes like we see, 30 solar mass black holes, actually pretty much have this type of waveform for LIGO, where you only have very, very few cycles, and where therefore the merger part of the waveform is really important in order to analyze the signals. So besides the waveforms, perhaps the, the even earlier question that microrelativity could answer is, what happens at all if you have your two black holes coming around? Is this the system behaving as simply as we now know it is, with just a nice uh, increase in, in power in the waveform and then needed to bring down, or are there more complicated intermediate stages? In another piece of information you can look for it's not only the waveform, but what, what, what the outcome is of this system, the remnant properties. So we start out with a sum and um, as black hole mass 1 and spin 1, and some black hole of mass 2 and spin 2. And this turns into a black hole of some final mass, some final spin and also some final velocity that goes under the name of kick velocity. And that arises when you have two black holes that are not symmetric. If the one black hole is less massive or the spin directions are not symmetric, then the gravitational wave emission is, anti is not symmetric. And you uh, one typically ends up in the situation where more gravitational energy is beamed, is sent into one direction than in the other direction. And this then leads to a recoil. If you have more linear momentum going this way, the remnant back hole will move the opposite way. So these are these, these kick velocities. And so working out what these, these remnant quantities are uh, requires involving the system from in spiral phase through merger into ring down. And again, this is only possible if you can get the merger and connect to initial conditions. Um, for neutron stars, there's quite a few other effects that can only be dealt with with yeah. numerics. Late in the in spiral, you have tidal deformations. During the merger itself, uh, you have a check of, of uh, mass, you have an accretion disk forms, and you may have a, a delayed collapse to a black hole or not. And so all this is different, all these um, behavior of what happens when you have the two neutron stars colliding needs to be explored with, with numerical simulations. So tidal deformations, um, How many injectors are there? Is there an accretion disk? 
And when does the environment collapse to the cold if at all? All this depends on the of the situation. While everybody is talking about compact binaries because of LIGO these days, there's actually a lot more you can do. Um, single bodies, especially collapse of, of neutron stars, or rather collapse of a star to a neutron star, and then potentially the neutron star will the home. Uh, this also is a, a nonlinear dynamic effect that requires strong uh, gravitational fields. The first step here is, is a supernova. And the second step may or may not happen inside a supernova as well. And whether it happens and how, how the precise details are requires the simulations. Then there's also more Uh, theoretical studies of the properties of Einstein's equations, and the, the most important one there is what would now go under the name critical collapse. Critical collapse. So the, the setup here is quite simple. You start with uh, some perturbation, say just a chunk of, of scalar field. So this is some scalar field. And now you consider what happens uh, as you change the, the amplitude of this field. Let's make a plot. Here's the amplitude on the x-axis, and here on the, on the y-axis, we'll see what we put in a few seconds. If we have very high amplitude with a scalar field, then it will collapse down to a black hole under its own gravitational forces. So over here on the right-hand side, we are going to form black holes with a certain mass, so on the y-axis here, I'm putting the mass of this black hole. And presumably, the bigger the amplitude you have, the bigger the black hole mass is. On the opposite side of things, close to zero, where you have only very little gravitational field, a scalar field, but, or none at all, you don't have a lot of gravitational forces, and so the scalar field will disperse. And so, at low enough amplitude, your black hole mass will be zero. You don't have any black hole. And now, seeing these two ends of the plot, one can ask the question, and people have asked the questions in the 90s already, what is going to happen in the middle? And it turns out, for a scalar field, uh, or in, in, more in general, Two different things can happen. It can happen that this curve actually stops at a finite mass and there's a gap. Or it can happen, depending on, on the system of uh, matter you have, that this, this actually goes down to zero and you end up having a black hole with arbitrarily small mass. And especially if you manage to tune precisely to this magical value here, it happens to be called a star usually, then uh, one has a naked singularity. Because um, one still has, has actually a singular space time, but it's just the value where the black hole mass happens to be zero. This, this type of system here, um, coming from first, first investigated by Choptuik in the 90s, I forget the business here. Uh, 
uh, actually played a role in one of Stephen Hawking's, Hawking's famous bets. So somewhere in the 80s or so, he, he wrote a bet, I believe it was even with Kip Thorne, that in general relativity, there will never be naked singularities. But any time a singularity forms, you have an event horizon around it that alters the singularity, and, and life is good. There was this first bet saying essentially there are no naked singularities in GR, they're always inside event horizons, period. And so it was a really nice short bet, three lines of text, um, a, a, a case of wine or whatever the, the, the thing was they were betting about. And then a few years later, Chopdwick showed these results with the naked singularity <coughs> that you can get if you're excessively careful in, in tuning your system. So there's a, an infinite amount of different possibilities for, possibilities for the initial data, this whole line of numbers for the amplitude. And if you put one single one of them, a set of measures zero, then you get a, a naked singularity. So Stephen conceded that bet. But Stephen being Stephen, being upset about having lost this bet, uh, he set up a new bet. The text was now no longer two lines, but roughly a page of text. It started out with, oh, having lost this last bet on a technical singularity, uh, technicality, I shall now try again. There are no naked singularities in internal relativity. And with naked singularities, I mean A, B, C, D, E, F, a long list of very technical mathematical definitions of what precisely is going on, including that he wants collapse to the black hole for a a open subset of initial data, excluding this particular set of measure zero type situation. And then at the end of this bet, and the winner will, uh, and the winner of this bet will, will give the loser a two bottles of way better wine than last time around. Um, quite fun pets. I have no idea what actually happened to them, but this, this bet is, is resolved by now. I don't think so. Because I, uh, this is the only case known so far where actually naked singularities form. Okay, so much for introduction of, of a few of the cases where one can use numerical relativity. And is this the only white one thing I have? Let's move on and actually go towards the formalism of how one goes about solving Einstein's equation. So the goal uh, is, quite simply, we want to solve Einstein's equations. We want to find a space-time metric G such that it satisfies Einstein's equations. So the Ricci tensor of this metric is, I'll be simple today, I'll just take a talk about vacuum, so I'm just putting this to zero. And we want to do so in an evolutionary manner, that we start at an early time, and then somehow evolve our space time towards later. We start with the two black holes at large separation, and then see them going about orbiting. Uh, so we want to go from now to later. Whatever now and later means. Uh, this point is quite important because the usual way uh, Einstein's equations in general relativity is presented is in, in with the big space-time continuum, where we have some manifold, space-time manifold M, and in here we have a, a metric G mu nu, and there is no preferred or unique time coordinate at all. We just have space-time. And so the first point that we need to do is we need to take the space-time and take an and split space-time 
back into space and time. In order for the computers to actually have a time coordinate to work with. This This is called a three plus one decomposition. Position. So the idea is we start with the space time volume and we now want to get a notion of time. We want to have some hypersurface here that we can call T1 and some other hypersurface that we can call T2 and many, many more in the middle, foliating the whole four-dimensional volume by these types of three-dimensional hypersurfaces. This is done with a time function. Uh, which we shall call T. And T goes from the manifold to the real numbers. And so at, at each point now of the manifold, we have a value of time. And we're arranging it such that as we go towards up, towards later, the time coordinate is increasing. And we are arranging it such that our hypersurfaces uh, are going to be defined as the level set functions of this overall time function. So I call the set of points of the manifold uh, where the time function takes a certain value. Uh, this is now going to be on the hypersurface. And those hypersurfaces, not defined using this time, um, are required to be spaced. There's still a tremendous freedom in how you do this because there's a tremendous freedom how you can put space-like surfaces into space-time. Um, even in Minkowski space, um, you have the obvious choice that you can put a, a constant time slice in our at-rest observer coordinates, or you can put constant time slices somewhere in this boosted, then the time slices will be rotated in space-time. And there's not even the, the notion that you need to have flat slices, they can be curved, like I was indicating here, and they can be curved in any way whatsoever. The only restriction is that they are always curved such that they are space-like, so that the light cones are always going, are always entirely on one side of, of each hypersurface. So things like this, hypersurface going like this, where the light cone is intersecting it, that would be it for me. And the reason is that the light cone structure, space-like versus time-like, uh, will give us the notion of causality moving forward in time. And by having the light cones always on one side, future pointing of our hypersurfaces, we have this notion that we still can move forward in time. So with this hypersurfaces, there comes now a quite large number of new geometric objects floating around. And the, the first P object is a normal Q 
to the hypersurfaces. So we want to set up eventually a normal vector, normal to the hypersurfaces. And getting there starts with a normal one form. Uh, it's often called, that's essentially just the derivative of t. So the, the gradient of gradient of level set surfaces are you know, the normal one forms to the level sets. And if you think about this a little bit, you'll notice that the obvious index placement of, of a gradient has, is a lower index. Because these you can compute without needing a metric. We'll call this thing omega. This is time-like because we said our surface is space -like. And having that, we can now normalize the thing. We can define the function alpha as the norm of this omega. Omega nu, omega nu, g nu nu. Because this is time-like, there's an overall minus sign. And now let's take the square root of this thing. And now having this, um, we can write normal normalized one form as minus alpha omega mu, and also the other index n mu equals g mu mu n mu. The one interesting thing here is this minus sign that you might not have expected. And that makes an future pointing. That means if you compute the gradient of time, and you contract this with the direction of n, as you go along n, it turns out because of this minus sign, um, this inner product is positive. This, this turns out to be alpha once again, and alpha is bigger than c. Because we have normalized by alpha, our n field has unit length n u n u equals minus one. Where the minus sign again comes in because n is, is tiny. Now we can play more games having the normal. We can now think about vectors and more generally tensors living within the hypersurface. So there's a set of spatial uh, tensors um, which are tangential to the hypersurfaces. And so this means, for instance, if you have such a such a spatial vector, let's call it mu, e its defining property is e mu equals in put it into n mu is zero. So it's it's a vector that is orthogonal to the normal, and so it must be tangential. And you can also generalize this to objects with arbitrary many indices, and what you want there is you want it for this, this object to be completely spatial, any contraction with, with, an, with an unit normal vanishes. we can do is we can project tensors 
into, into the hypersphere. So the draw a little picture. Here's the hypersurface. And I have a generic vector floating around here. I'm doing it with a vector because it's easiest to draw. I can now write it as a component V of orthogonal N U and a component a vector V parallel. The orthogonal, comp orthogonal component, the orthogonal, oh, the, the, the parallel component, the parallel, is is spatial, so this thing must have zero inner product with, with n. And so if I'm now writing v as v parallel u plus v orthogonal times n u, contracting with n mu gives me v mu n mu equals zero minus v parallel. And so that's the definition of the parallel. And that's the definition of the orthogonal. And so now we have the parallel component, the parallel mu, is the whole thing. V mu minus uh, the parallel one, minus the orthogonal one. This is um, V mu minus N mu V N mu N mu. And these indices can now be written as a a little bit more fancy as a projection, projection v mu mu minus n mu n mu times mu mu. The same procedure can also be applied to any other tensor. Uh, works the same way, and the way to get the, the tangential component, the spatial part of the tensor, is by hitting each index with this projection operator, this matrix gamma mu mu. Interesting vector to a tensor to, to also project into the hypersurface is the metric itself. So if, if you project G mu mu into, into uh, one of these hypersurfaces, the way to do this <coughs> is by hitting each index with one of these projection matrices. And
if you go through the steps, because the gammas here are delta minus mu sigma minus m mu n sigma, let's first do the first gamma. We find that, well, for the delta times g, this is a, this just replaces an index on the, on the metric, g sigma mu. Um, and the, the g lowers the index on n, so we have a n mu n sigma. I messed up some minus signs somewhere before. Let's try and fix those. Here is the minus sign in the parallel DP of Fokanau. If we want this equation here, then we have correctly v parallel is v minus v orthogonal. But the v orthogonal has a minus sign sitting here, and this minus sign turns into a plus sign here, and turns into a plus sign for this particular projection. That plus sign now turns up over here and here. Okay, so now we still have the second gamma to take care of, gamma mu rho. And doing that, acting on the first, the metric times the gamma, will lower the, the, the index of the gamma. So this is a gamma uh, lower sigma. And from the second term, we just get a zero, because gamma acting on, on n gives us zero. Gamma is a orthogonal to n. And so what we have is that the projection of the, of the spatial metric into sigma is this gamma thing. And so if you now have distances within the, within the surface, <coughs> For instance, if we have a, a distance dx mu <coughs> such that dx mu and mu equals zero, if this is a spatial distance going between two points of within our surface, then the, the, the distance, the line element, the s squared, is usually or is always g mu mu dx mu dx mu, but because of this calculation over here, and because dx is space-like, we can measure spatial distances with the spatial metric instead of the space-time metric. So this, this gamma is the spatial metric With it, we can lower, raise and lower spatial indices.
Uh, with it, we can measure distance. within the hypersurfaces sigma t. This racing and loading of indices, let's just try it out. Let's take our uh, parallel vector again. We parallel with an upper index, or rather, Let's try to compute the mean with the lower index. Mean. This is, as always with vectors, this is a chi mu nu, hitting the mean parallel with the upper index. Uh, now we can write the chi as the gamma minus n mu minus n mu. That's just the definition of gamma in terms of chi, the equation I've written down down there, but with the different index placement. Uh, still hitting the mean parallel with an upper index. By definition, the parallel acting on n vanishes. So this is indeed the spatial metric gamma uh, operating on the vector in parallel. So, we have already spatial vectors and tensors within the hypersurface. We have a spatial metric and we can now go on and keep on playing differential geometry within the, within the vector surface. The one next thing that's missing is a derivative of point. So on the, on the way towards differential geometry, We need a, a derivative operator, and the derivative operator, so the spatial derivative operator, will act only on spatial tensors. And the way it is defined, is by d mu of, say, a function f as the space-time derivative of the same function f, and then uh, hit with one of these projection operators gamma, gamma mu. So this is the, on the right-hand side here, this is the, the space-time, the 4D derivative. And this here is our spatial derivative. And it also works for any other type object, for instance, for a vector. We will write this as the space time. the space-time derivative. And now we are hitting each of the indices on the right-hand side with one of the gammas. Gamma mu, mu prime, gamma mu, mu prime. And it's just easiest to keep track of indices if you use the same symbol for, for both places left and right and distinguish them with the prime. Having derivatives, the next thing we need is, is the curvature tensor.
And that one is defined exactly the same way in the SSM digital dimension geometry by commutation of second covariant derivatives. Um, getting the indices right is always painful. So we have something like d mu d mu minus d mu d mu this acts on a, a one form w rho and if this were space-time derivatives and a space-time vector then on the right hand side of this equation uh, this would equal the Riemann Answer. R sigma rho mu mu w sigma for all omega sigma. So so far this looks pretty much like the this is actually identical to the space time definition. The only thing where the spatial part comes in is that we don't have the space-time derivatives but the spatial derivatives. And that this thing here now defines the three-dimensional reach uh, Riemann tensor. And that this definition must hold for all spatial. Ws only. This now will define all the spatial components of, of the three Riemann. But because we're still defining everything with space-time indices, we, we need to set the other components to zero explicitly. So we have something, some extra conditions like this thing contracted into, into the unit normal must vanish. And having our three-dimensional Riemann tensor, we can now contract uh, to get a three-dimensional Ricci tensor and the three-dimensional place of the digit. Um, should you have a new in your second term? Just, uh, Which well, second just, term? Uh, yeah, right. Yes, you're absolutely right. It's the, it's the commutation of second covariant derivatives that gives you the, the Riemann tensor. If these were partial derivatives, if we were in flat space, uh, they would commute and the Riemann would be zero. So, so far we've built up formalism within the hypersurface. We now have a metric within the hypersurface, fit each one of them separately. And we can play the full differential geometry, ge geometry game just with the mean hypersurface. Now let's think a little bit about how the hypersurfaces relate to the surrounding space. Because this, these intrinsic uh, quantities don't yet specify the entire degrees of freedom we have. For instance, this is cool, this is the first time I actually have a sheet of paper with me with, with a rectangular grid on it. Uh, here I have a nice flat two-dimensional piece of paper. It has a rectangular grid on it, 
Uh, all the distances are flat space distances. This, this is a flat two-dimensional manifold, this, this piece of paper. And the distances within the, the man, within this sheet of paper will not change if I take this flat sheet of paper and curve it. This is still a flat two-dimensional manifold. Uh, the angles within the sheet piece of paper haven't changed, the distances haven't changed. So just knowing the intrinsic quantities of the, of the hypersurfaces is not enough to completely fix anything about the hypersurfaces. What we need is some notion of how the hypersurface is embedded into surrounding space. Whether it looks like this, which I would naively call flat, or whether it looks more like this, where it would be embedded in some curved way. Um, the quantity that's going to describe this is called the extrinsic curvature because it's, it measures properties extrinsic to the hypersurface. And the, the basic idea of what this is, is you get by looking at the normal to the hypersurface. If my sheet of paper is flat, and I let the normal go across the surface, the normal doesn't change direction. If the sheet of is, is curved, and I let my normal go across the surface, the normal will change direction. And so this extrinsic curvature is going to be related to the gradient of the normal as you go across the surface. Um, so the extrinsic curvature has to do with the embedding of the hypersurfaces sigma into the manifold. We have our, our hypersurface sigma and, and unit normals. These unit normals. change direction from point to point. And so the definition I just gave you is indeed the definition of this type of this extrinsic curvature tensor. It is the gradient of the unit one form. Turns out it is symmetrized. And once again, it turns out this thing is most conveniently defined if one projects now each index into the hypersurface. Uh, sorry, now I have too many two similar indices. Let me turn this into a row. And now only this is work And one now can show that k mu mu can also be written as the very same expression without symmetrization. That means that I don't really have to enforce symmetrization because it, it turns out that the expression is symmetric anyway. And perhaps more interesting, one can show that this k mu nu is also related to another derivative called the Lee derivative. Um, So this, this thing is called Lee derivative. You may have encountered it before in the general relativity course. If not, we don't really need it much. What we need is the 
is the notion that this legal derivative is essentially d by dt. And so what we now have, this, this expression might sound strange, might, might look strange to you, that the change in the unit normal vectors actually has something to do with the spatial metric. The way you can think about this is by considering a a let's, let's draw two more arrows here a little bit more carefully. Is how distances change if you start with some element here of a certain length the length you would measure with, with the metric. And if you consider this a little time later, going orthogonal to the surface, you see that the, intuitively you see that the length of this element actually changes if the surface is curved. And so the length is measured by a metric, you have the same coordinates here and here along the two ends. The change in the length is going to be reflected in the change in the spatial metric from the one vector surface to the next. Okay, let's finish this uh, business with, with relating space and space-time. And let's, let me write down a few more relationships that relate the three-dimensional uh, Riemann and Ricci tensors to their four-dimensional counterparts. And those equations will now come in later uh, when we are splitting Einstein equations into different pieces. So we can now begin and to be late. four-dimensional and three-dimensional curvature. So one can show that the four-dimensional of the one tensor, okay, this is going to become tedious, mu, nu, rho, sigma, completely projected into the hypersurface, so giving every single one of your indices with a gamma. Happens to be the three-dimensional Riemann tensor plus extrinsic curvature terms. K mu prime rho prime K mu prime sigma prime minus K mu prime sigma prime K mu prime rho prime. This equation is called the Gauss equation. And let's see what we get at the end of the day. So this is here is a 
Let's, let's do this a little bit. The three-dimensional spatial Riemann tensor is a completely spatial quantity. Yeah, shouldn't the primes on the left-hand side of the equation? The primes on the left-hand side of the equations should be downstairs. Yes. Thank you for pointing this out. This thing is a completely spatial object. And which only contains spatial derivatives. The extrinsic curvature terms, as I just pointed out, are essentially first time derivatives. So we have spatial derivatives and only first time derivatives on the right hand side of the equal sign. So these pieces of the four-dimensional Riemann tensor uh, do not contain second time derivatives. Uh, contain only spatial and first time derivatives. So, on our quest towards getting evolutionary wave equations, those things here have only first time derivatives and not second time derivatives. Going on, This time around, let's change what we are doing and let's take one of our indices and hit it with an N. And the other three indices we still keep with gammas. Take a, a partial spatial projection and keep one of the indices in the time like direction. If you do this, what you end up getting is terms with the extrinsic curvature on the right hand side. When local line minus d mu plan k. And this one is called the Kodatsi equation. And the same as above, the K contains first time derivatives. But it also, and so again, we have only first time derivatives and spatial derivatives in these, these components. The last thing we can do is we can project we can keep two uh, normal projections on the left hand side. Uh, for our real new row zipper, let's hit the new, the new with an N. And let's hit the row with an N. And let's keep the other two components spatial.
one works through this particular equation. The right hand side is going to have a few interesting things. The first one is a another knee derivative, this time of the uh, expensive curvature. And then a few extra terms that have to do with this alpha function that we've defined earlier. This alpha function is the one that came from the normalization of, of t. So just to remind you, uh, we had defined n mu equals minus alpha squared in mu of t. So it's this alpha function that suddenly shows up. And then there are this one more extensive curvature term. There's a k mu prime lambda k lambda sigma prime. And this time we have time derivative coming from the D derivative operating on the time derivative of the k. So here now we have an expression that is going to have second second time derivatives. And so after the break, uh, we'll be using these equations and pulling out of this, this last equation down here, this is called the Ricci equation. In all of these equations, especially the Ricci equations, the second time derivative terms, and those then will turn into the evolution equations for Einstein. But let's make a break first. Thank you.